There was once a time where when an online game shut down, that was it. It was an end of an era. But through the years, occasionally on rare instances, a game that would be shut down would somehow in some way make its way back online. And those are the games we want to talk about today. Let's start here. When Final Fantasy XIV first released, it's actually insane how much backlash there was with this game. Like the ratings were awful. Fans didn't like the game. They felt like it was unfinished. I think there was like subscription fees tied to the game. This is all the way back in 2000. 2010, mind you. But nowadays, Final Fantasy XIV is like toted as one of the greatest MMORPGs that's out there. But originally, this game was so bad, they ended up shutting down the service altogether and then essentially redoing development to reopen the game later on as a completely different game. That's not something you ever really hear about in the gaming industry nowadays. That they did focus on trying to fix up the game a bit in its original state and even did this big doomsday storyline to conclude the Final Fantasy XIV story arc. But after after that, things were shut down. So after the official shutdown, the development team went back at it and started reworking the game and tried to build a much better MMO. And a little over a year later, Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn was instead released and it actually had some positive acclaim. Final Fantasy is like the craziest turnaround story for any video game ever especially with the way that they handled it. And with some consistent support over the years, this game ended up becoming massively popular. Just a couple of years ago, it became so popular that they had to disable new signups because they didn't have server space for new players for a while. So while in most cases, when the game shuts down, it marks the end of an era, this one ended up becoming just exactly what the series needed to continue as an MMO. You know, back in the early 2010s, Skate 3 was like actually a pretty popular game. Not only was it like the ultimate skate game coming out as the ultimate of a trip, trilogy of games, but also with the rise of YouTube, there were kind of some funny moments with the mechanics and the whole Hall of Meat minigame. It kind of made Skate 3 last longer and become more popular than the previous games. Also, the game was highly competitive and there were still a lot of people playing this game online for quite some time after the release of the game. But 2015 was kind of a weird year. Skate 3, alongside the other Skate games, would randomly have their servers shut off, making online play unaccessible. And fans were hoping that Skate 4 would get announced and uh, that never happened. So yeah, EA just kind of soft killed Skate randomly with no explanation or announcement. But then a couple of years later in 2018, it seemed like EA was putting together the resources to start up a brand new studio that would take over the Skate franchise because the original team Black Box, their studio had already been shut down by EA. But with a new studio leading the charge to eventually develop a new Skate game, EA decided to randomly just switch those Skate 3 servers back on and people were able to connect again. It might have been partially because of the fact that Xbox introduced backwards compatibility so more players would be jumping on board and trying out skate if you know EA got skate 3 listed again and sure enough that's what ended up happening now skate 3 can be played through like the whole EA access thing and it's online is still intact we can't say the same for skate 2 which also had a really great online man I miss skate 2 <laughs> Rest in peace. But at least Skate 3 was able to come back from the dead. Does anyone remember the game Gigantic? It was this interesting hybrid game that was kind of like a mix of Overwatch and maybe Smite with a different art style that only went into full access in 2017 and then abruptly was shut down in 2018. Unfortunately for this game, it never ended up catching on with the player base that it had wanted, likely because there was all of a sudden a lot of competition in the hero shooter genre with games like Overwatch, Paladins, Battleborn, and all those other things. I did play Gigantic when it did go into like early access or something. I had no idea what I was doing, but it looked interesting. But still, there was a small community that did enjoy the game. Nonetheless, it unfortunately shut down and randomly years later in 2021, Embracer Group apparently acquired the publisher Perfect World Entertainment from its Chinese parent company, which then became like the bigger Gearbox Publishing. And apparently this is like just through like posts that people have made on like the subreddit for Gigantic. Last year in April, a couple of fans emailed Gearbox asking them to bring Gigantic back. And I guess randomly they're like, yeah, sure, why not? We'll bring it back for a day. So five years after this game released, Gearbox announced a gigantic throwback event where essentially they emailed codes to existing gigantic fans, giving them a window of time to play in October for about a little over 24 hours. And then new people who signed up also could get access to play as well. And for one day, this 
five-year-old game was brought back into the world and players were able to play it for a day. Now this did make a lot of headlines, but it's unknown if Gearbox has any plans of resurrecting this game beyond just like a one-time throwback event. Maybe they're trying to gauge interest if people would like jump on board with a little bit of buzz and hype, or maybe it was just something for the fans five years later. Nonetheless, it was a really cool move and I would support other studios doing interesting things like this where they randomly resurrect a game and have like a play session for a while so people can come back and play it. That'd be awesome. I could see EA doing that now that they've shut down some other classic games like Battlefield 1943. But yeah, this one's really unique because it was just like a little weekend of gigantic and that's cool. If we look back to 2022, with the release of Elden Ring, more players than ever before were being introduced to the Soulsborne genre of games, or essentially a new experience that would probably interest a lot of players to go back and check out the backlog of other games that From Software had done. But at the beginning of 2022, Bandai Namco actually found a big security vulnerability found in a lot of the PvP servers throughout their Dark Souls releases. Bandai wanted extra time to investigate these issues to prevent them from occurring so they went ahead and shut down all the servers for the main trilogy of Dark Souls along with the Prepare to Die edition. And these servers were down for a really long time. No one expected them to be down as long as they were and some people started to fear that possibly Bandai might be thinking about just abandoning these older servers because the games have been out for a while. Nonetheless, months later, after Elden Ring had released and even more months had passed after that, eventually an update came from Bandai Namco announcing that they would be bringing those servers back online finally, which is great because a lot of people wanted to try to experience some of the features of those games, especially coming right off of the hype of Elden Ring and people looking back at all the Dark Souls games. So finally, they were brought back online. However, some small other news did pop up that Dark Souls 2, specifically the Xbox 360 servers and PlayStation 3 servers, will be shutting down their online functionality in March 2024. I don't know if this next one counts fully, but I wanted to include it anyways, but last year was actually a big year for Call of Duty, with there being some pretty big security holes in Call of Duty's online multiplayer connections and the older multiplayer games not functioning the way that they were kind of supposed to. It's actually pretty wild how last summer, the acquisition of Activision by Xbox might have actually maybe pushed Activision to, you know, actually go back and fix some of their old servers. And finally, they did fix their multiplayer servers, which had been down for all of the old Glory Day Call of Duty titles. Now, it does seem like the servers did work maybe intermittently. You could still do offline private modes, so it wasn't like a full official shutdown or anything like that, but it did take a while for Call of Duty to fully get fixed. And when it was announced that, hey, these old Call of Duty games are working again, there was a huge rush from players to go and relive the glory days, which kind of snowballed into even more people jumping on board because all of a sudden people were playing old Modern Warfare 2, old Modern Warfare 3, World at War again. I mean, thousands of players were jumping back on to experience Black Ops multiplayer like it was 2010 all over again. It was probably the biggest resurgence to old Call of Duty games we've seen in years, and it was a cool time to be there, even if it was a result of a partial shutdown. Yeah, still not sure where this fits in this category of games that came back from being shut down, but you get what I'm talking about. When NBA 2K14 released, it already had a rocky launch. It had this always online thing that caused a ton of issues with people not being able to connect to servers or disconnecting during games and stuff like that. And to play modes like My Career or My GM, you had to be connected to the internet. Now, just 18 months after the release, the servers were actually shut down, meaning a ton of people just lost their progress because the save files for My Career and My GM were stored on the servers. To put this into perspective, at the time, games like FIFA 12 or Madden NFL 12 were still online and those games released like three years prior. So it wasn't common at all for a sports game to just shut down the servers after 18 months. And this obviously caused huge fan outcry and you know, people complained about losing their progress, which understandably would be frustrating. And before the servers were actually shut down, 2K promised that the online save files would just transfer automatically to be offline save files. But when the servers shut down, that actually didn't happen. So after all the fan outcry finally reached 2K, they turned the servers back on a couple days later and extended the period that the game would be online for another nine months. Which obviously was good for people that were able to access their save files again, but still such a weird decision to shut it down this early. I'm gonna count RuneScape here just because of the whole development story of how 
old school RuneScape came to be is incredibly interesting. RuneScape was hugely popular throughout the 2000s, and honestly, it makes sense that RuneScape would want to stay on top of their game popularity-wise and continue to roll out big updates that would keep the game modern and relevant and one that would be able to compete with some of the other big MMO games out there. But slowly over the years and into the early 2010s, RuneScape started to lose the identity that so many players had originally fallen in love with. The simplistic graphics, the UI, all of that was kind of a mix of features that made people love the game so much. And while by 2013, RuneScape 3 was about to launch, and while that launch was very exciting for the developers Jagex, I think there was some awareness that a lot of the old players were kind of nostalgic for the things that they used to get to experience in older builds of the game. And when they discovered that they had a backup saved from a build of RuneScape from 2007, they presented the idea of launching a separate client, which would become Old School RuneScape. And while this just started as like a little side project for people who are nostalgic of the old RuneScape games, over the following years, it slowly became more popular than the new RuneScape 3, reaching numbers as high as 200,000 concurrent players in 2023. What's interesting though is while this game looks primitive as it was maybe in 2007, there are now updates and new features being added to the game, all in which are ideas presented to the community and then the community actually gets to vote on the ideas and then for like a proposed idea to actually make it into a new game update, it requires 75% support. If not, the idea will either be dropped altogether or reworked and then represented in another poll for people to vote on again. A very unique way of running an MMO in 2023, but hey, it seems to have worked because now they realize how important the integrity of what that game that people played back in those mid-2000s really was to the core experience. So good for RuneScape. You know, Little Big Planet also had some issues with security breaches or whatnot. Little Planet 1, 2, and 3 on the PS3, along with like a PS Vita version of the game, would have its whole servers taken out due to DDoS attacks and were kind of being turned on and off intermittently throughout March of 2021 and ultimately were shut off during that time altogether. This one doesn't really have as much of a happy ending as much as it's like a, well, a silver-ish lining. But finally, PlayStation decided to acknowledge the fact that all of the servers had been shut down and stated that the servers will now be taken down permanently with an exception of Little Big Planet 3 for the PlayStation 4. That one would be receiving an update, which would include a ton of content created for Little Big Planet on the PlayStation 3 era still. So while ultimately there was a pretty big loss for the Little Big Planet community, at least one of the games with its huge library of community-made experiences would be able to be preserved in some way or another, even if it meant the shutdown would still affect those previous generation players still. If you watch our video from a couple of weeks ago, you might remember the game Evolve. The game Evolve was kind of like this asymmetrical multiplayer game where one person was the monsters and then there was four hunters and you know the game never really took off and that's why the servers were shut down in june of 2018 but then randomly in 2022 almost exactly four years after the servers were shut down they just came back online and there was no reason why just one day people noticed that the game was able to be played again now not all the online functionality returned like there was no ranked matchmaking and the store didn't work but you could host and search for games which you know made the game playable after four years once again but there's kind of a sad ending to this because in July of 2023 the servers were taken offline once again and they'll probably never come back this time. Let's go back to 1996. This game called The Realm Online, originally just called The Realm, released and boy oh boy is this a traditional looking MMORPG but it was really cool back in the day. Now this game never ended up being as popular as some of the bigger games from back in its time like Ultima Online or EverQuest and it actually ended up changing hands multiple times from different publishers. But June 30th, 2023 was a sad day for players been playing this game for like multiple decades now. The last game server ended up getting closed as there were complications with who had the IP and rights to the game. Nonetheless though, finally a new company swooped in with the name of Virtual World Holding Company and essentially decided to resurrect the game, allowing for that old server, Despothes Grove, to be reopened and a brand new server to be opened up. 
But hey, now that means that even 27 years later, you can still play this game, even if it only had a short four month hiatus where the servers were shut down and they thought the future of the game was over. What a legacy. Okay, now we definitely need to talk about Halo 2, because this was one of the most notorious examples of a game that was widely loved being shut down well before it probably deserved to be. You know, Xbox Live probably wouldn't be nearly as popular as it is today and still relevant today, even if they try to rename it, if it wasn't for the existence of Halo 2 back in the original Xbox days. This was the game that got players jumping on board to play games online, on a console, with like voice chat and all of that other stuff, it was a big deal. Up until Xbox Live, really, it was just kind of like a little niche thing on some other consoles, and like, it was bigger on like PC to play multiplayer. But Halo 2 changed everything and like, defined competitive FPS games online. And of course, Halo 2 was still hugely popular even after later Halo games released. Halo 3 came out, and ultimately some Halo 2 purists just didn't like Halo 3's multiplayer as much as Halo 2's. Halo 2 had really specific intricacies, like being able to super bounce or do button combos to reload your gun quicker. So for some people, Halo 2 was just special to them and the matchmaking system and the way that you leveled up was like really addicting and people were still grinding out their levels through the end of Halo 2 times. But in 2010, Microsoft announced that all Xbox original servers would be shut down, essentially meaning that Halo 2, which clearly was the most popular Xbox original game still being supported by Xbox Live, would be shutting down with it. This is actually absolutely insane if you think about it. The shutdown of Halo 2 happened just six years after Halo 2's release. That's really not that long of time. It'd be like the modern day equivalent of like, I guess if Apex Legends randomly announced they were shutting down. It would be surprising just because of how popular the game was and that it still had a decent player base at its time. I actually remember going back and playing a couple of matches back before the server shut down through my Xbox 360 because you could just play, you know, backwards compatible games easily back then. I remember playing on Warlock and people in voice chat yelling at me for not playing well. It was a great time. Nonetheless, the server shut down coinciding with a beta playtest of Halo Reach that was going public. However, there was a handful of players that held out and that became like a whole iconic group of players that refused to shut their Xboxes off. They took time off of work and they hung in there as long as they could until there was just like two people left playing together, just, you know, back and forth. And then there was just one guy left. And then after all of that, Halo 2 was just gone. For a while there, a few years actually, you just couldn't pick up an Xbox and play Halo 2 online anymore at all. If you wanted to experience Halo 2's multiplayer back during the years of 2010 to 2014 really, you had to either reverse connect your Xbox into like a digital tunneling system where you could use like X-Link Kai and connect and play with other people who are also online. Though finding games wasn't necessarily the easiest things, there were still a couple of lobbies you could jump in. Or I guess you could have like an old school LAN party. Halo 2 Vista was already three years old at this point and Halo 2 Vista was not very popular in how badly it was optimized when it released. Um, but I know some people did go over there because what else are you gonna do? But yeah, it was kind of a weird time. It was very unheard of for games that were that big just to automatically have their server shut down. Typically, you could go back and play old games online still. It just seemed like Halo 2 was unlucky being on the original Xbox. But finally, in 2014, the Master Chief Collection was announced, which would bring Halo 2, all of its multiplayer maps, in an upgraded form with 60 frames per second for the Xbox One. And when uh, MCC launched, it was a mess. It was like one of the worst releases of all time. Even better, they ported the Vista version of Halo 2 into MCC. It wasn't even the right Halo 2 version. Oh no. Eventually, over time, they slowly got their act together with MCC. It was a long, tedious process. But at the very least, back in 2014, you could start playing the occasional game of Halo 2 online. And after many waits and long time more waiting, Halo 2 is now at least playable. You still can't super bounce. You still have to deal with the occasional random thing that MCC has going on, and the original matchmaking system that was so popular in Halo 2 isn't there still nowadays, but at least you can play the game. And that's better than what other games have fates of when servers shut down and there's just nothing left. So Halo 2 did manage to make its return from its four years of being completely dead and unplayable. Now with Halo 2 getting a resurrection like this, what about the actual original Halo 2? This leads into this really crazy rabbit hole that's really, really awesome if you were just like a fan of the original Xbox. But there is a really awesome fan project known as 
Project Insignia. Essentially, it's Xbox players who've been able to reverse engineer essentially the online servers that the original Xbox Live was hosted on. I mean, that's like a very simplified version of what happened. Long story short, they were able to set up their own network of servers that operate and are compatible with any original Xbox. And all you have to do as a player to connect to those servers is change some numbers in the DNS settings on the Xbox, which is just like in the regular internet connectivity section. And then instead, when the Xbox Xbox is trying to connect to what it thinks is the old Xbox Live servers, which are no longer available. It just gets redirected and connects to Insignia, and now all of a sudden, Xbox Live on those old Xboxes are back. Now, of course, every game uses different infrastructures for connecting online. So when this first went live, there was only a handful of games available. And then by a year later, there was over 150 total games available. So many different classic games that you could now connect to online and have like that regular OG Xbox Live experience, except Halo 2, unfortunately, still was not one of those games that was on the list to be able to be brought back online because it had a more complicated infrastructure. Matter of fact, if I remember correctly, I don't even think it was planned to be supported with Insignia just because of those hurdles they'd have to jump over to try to make it work. Nonetheless, just like a month ago, the Insignia team actually kind of teased that they've been dabbling with Halo 2 a little bit to see what it would take to possibly bring it back online. And they teased this by showing that they managed to get into the online connectivity for Halo 2 and update the old Bungie message of the day with a simple New Year's message. But still, that leaves us very optimistic that we might get to see the true to form original Xbox Live experience for Halo 2 brought back where you could matchmake with other players, level up, and do all those old glitches that were only available in the original Xbox version of Halo 2. Similarly, there's been another project more recently being talked about for the Xbox 360, which works on the original Xbox 360 hardware, which is called Sunrise, which is like the opposite of Sunset, which is what happened to the Halo servers like a year and a half ago. Since you can't play the original Xbox 360, online anymore with like matchmaking and whatnot. This Sunrise project aims to essentially do the same thing, restoring the online capabilities to the Halo games. And as far as we can tell, Halo Reach seems to be working pretty well. And apparently Halo 3 along with Halo 4 should also be working or at least will be working soon. And this is a really big deal because achievement hunters out there who want to get 100% completion on Halo 3 or Reach or Halo 4 might still have multiplayer locked achievements that you technically can't get anymore because the the online components of the games are down. So by having this project in place, you would be able to go back and legitimately get those achievements. And there'll also probably be a lot of people boosting those achievements, which hey, at this point with servers being not available in an official capacity, if you're gonna go through Sunrise and you find someone who wants to help you get those achievements, I say go for it. Nonetheless, this is just like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to really cool things that the fan community or just in general, like non-official teams have taken on to bring back old retired video games. City of Heroes is an MMO that was published in the mid-2000s by NCSoft. And for a while, the game got a lot of updates and was supported well. And it ran all the way until 2012 when the servers were shut down. And for years, this was just a forgotten MMO that you probably never heard of. But in 2019, they actually started publishing the source code for the servers of City of Heroes, meaning that if you're proficient enough in like, you know, running a game server, you're able to host private servers for City of Heroes. And this is what spawned a fan project Project City of Heroes Homecoming, which aimed to restore all the functionality of City of Heroes so people could play it again. And just a couple days ago, in an unprecedented move, NCSoft actually granted Homecoming the official license to host the game, meaning they turned this fan project into an official way to play the game, which is something I don't think has ever happened before. And there's so many MMO revival projects run by fans, so it's kind of cool to see one actually get the official blessing. There was Toontown Online, does anybody remember that game? That was a wild, like, Disney-endorsed experience. When that ended up shutting down, fans came together and recreated the experience in the form of Toontown Rewritten. And, uh, I remember this game a little bit, but, uh, my friend was really into it. So I, I tried to play it just to play with him. It wasn't my cup of tea, but he was like the, you know, like the kid who whose parents had a lot of money and they would uh, 
like give him all of like the the like cards that you could buy at the store so he had all the stuff at the toontown cash yeah he had the toontown cash i don't know what the currency was but like he was like way in like some deep part of the game and i was like running around with a free account trying to figure out what to do i mean there were people out there who really enjoyed toontown and i think still come back and play it today and then there was other games though that also kind of fall into this like disney category club penguin shut down and pretty much immediately there was like a fan server but then there was like a ton of controversy with that server and some like weird creepy people on there or something uh so i i don't know if it's actually still up I want to say they got a cease and desist from Disney eventually. Club Penguin rewritten did have a lot of users on it, like 11 million users. I mean, it pretty much went live pretty quickly after Club Penguin shut down. So I was able to kind of like ride off of the, like, I guess like the morning fans that lost that game. But yeah, I mean, I guess they just took over an audience, right? Like easy peasy. Right. Yeah. So and it was like technically when Club Penguin was at the biggest popularity wise in years was when it was shutting down because people didn't want to go. So yeah, I remember yeah. everyone talking about it on the internet. Yeah, it was wild. And then they did like the whole Club Penguin Island thing and I tried playing it, dude. It was, it was so dumb. It just was not Club Penguin. First of all, they're penguins. Why are they on an island? I mean, like a, like a tropical island. You know what I mean? Second of all, it was a mobile game. It, it's, I don't know, it's dumb. But then there's uh, Warhammer Online, which is actually still pretty active from what I've seen. And um, it's a revival project that is called Return of Reckoning. So um, it's a fully private server. It's owned by fans, but they've actually been doing some cool stuff with it. They've been restoring cut content into the game. You know, I think there was like cities or something restored that didn't make it into the original game but are now in the private server so overall it's a pretty cool project and uh, whenever i read about it people say it's very active still all right that's one thing we found when we we're doing research for this video is that like there are so many mmos that have shut down and then there's like fan efforts out there to try to revive it but probably more than we'll get into for this specific video like there was like a matrix one a lot of like really old games that are no longer around anymore it is really fascinating to like see how fans have been able to figure out and then also like keep the community alive long after the game like shuts down. Yeah, I do have to say uh, while doing research, I found a lot of revival projects for MMOs where there weren't any players or they were abandoned and they never finished them. So that also happens a lot where people lose interest. Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. That is something I could see happening. Yeah, yeah. also one MMO that is uh, near and dear to my heart is Wildstar. And there is a revival project called Nexus Forever. And you know, I don't think it's been updated as much. I think you can just play the original Wildstar experience and that's it and uh you know that's kind of meh because wildstar did have its limitations and never got updated like it should have was wildstar fun did you like that yeah i liked it i liked it but uh i think why didn't you introduce it to me what if that was the mmo to get we me didn't even MMOs? know each other when this game came out what if that was the game that could have been the game to get me into mmos dude the game shut down in 2018 we barely knew each other hey we knew each other enough to start rocket's law yeah. you could have showed me wildstar dude and uh it probably would have been the same we're like we're doing quests and you're like What's the point of this? <laughs> why do we have to go deliver something? Why are there so many fetch quests? Yeah, why do we have to walk from point A to A and point B? I don't know, that's all MMOs are. It is interesting how many MMOs came out after like World of Warcraft and all of the success there. Obviously now, we didn't talk about specifically in this video, but there's the like World of Warcraft classic. Right. Kind of like what RuneScape did in a way. Have you ever heard of the MMO Ion? No. Um, you know, it's another MMO from back in the day. I don't know. There's They also made a classic version last year. And really? that's, that's been going decently well for them too you know there's a classic version of runescape i think out there too there's like old school runescape which is what i understand as runescape 2 like from its glory days right that's how we explained in this video but i think there was runescape 1 and somewhere along the line they released like runescape classic for the fans of the old runescape interesting that thought runescape 2 which is now old school runescape was like too advanced. I'm surprised Trevalon isn't on RuneScape Classic at this point. Nah, dude, he's all about that RuneScape old school RuneScape <laughs> life. Put a picture of Trevalon on the screen somewhere in there playing RuneScape. There's another MMO, and I'm only gonna mention this because we recently been getting into the Shin Megami series with Persona, right? Oh yeah, I love Persona. And there used to be a Shin Megami Tensai MMO called... Actually, I don't remember the name, but the, the, the re-release was called Reimagine, and the MMO was set in between the first two games. It used this infrastructure that was basically like a hacked emulated version of the game, and the right. people who made that hacked emulated version were separate from the people who ran the Reimagine project. But the 
Reimagine Project used that infrastructure, obviously, right? Right. Those people who made that emulator got a cease and desist from Atlas, okay. which is unfortunate. And then the private server decided to shut down too last year. Sad. So it was there for a while and then it was gone. Yep. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think a lot of this category did fall into like MMOs because technically those are live service games and in general, live service games are more likely to completely be shut down. And the, you know, MMOs have kind of been the longest streak of live service games still supported years later. Uh, we've only seen it more so in like other genres recently, but there are a few examples of other games out there. Fantasy Star Online, the original online one that came out in the Sega Dreamcast, the GameCube, the PlayStation 2, and I think the Xbox. The Xbox is a little bit weird. It did come out on the Xbox, but it was like its own separate thing. You can still connect and play online. Uh, just the official servers have been shut down, but there are fan run servers out there so you can connect on your original hardware. Like I think people still play on the Dreamcast and I think that's incredible. You can connect on the PC as well, but like the fact that there's people out there on the GameCube version and the Dreamcast version and maybe the PS2 version connecting and still playing Fantasy Star Online all these years later is really cool for some reason to me. I mean, that's crazy actually. Yeah. I mean, that just shows how uh, insane MMO players usually are with their games. They really right. want to play. And it's a dream cat. Like, like, just think about yeah. it. Like, there's people out there who are like, yeah, let me just like play the Dreamcast right now. That is that alone. The fact that there's a Dreamcast game that you can still connect and play with other people with is like mind blowing to me. Another game completely mind blowing to me that people are still playing <laughs> Battleborn. Do you remember that game? Yeah, that uh, one uh, was something else. Uh, apparently, there is a resurrection fan project called Battleborn Reborn, and it lets you play Battleborn online again. Honestly, for a game that retails, I think you should be able to uh, get to. I, I think it's dumb to take away access because of like servers. I wish there was always a way to like, you know, continuously have options for fans to connect. So it's always great when projects like this come up, and. Uh, I think it's good that the people who are really hardcore Battleborn fans can keep playing Battleborn. I don't think uh, I, I necessarily need to experience this one, but I am happy for Battleborn fans out there who are able to continue to play Battleborn. Yeah, I mean, as bad as I thought the game was when it came out, uh, I do think it's weird that there will be so many like games that will just be lost media. Cause like, yeah, in a way. Yeah, because like they're just gone, you know what I mean? Right, it's like gigantic, right? I think it's cool that they did the little event to let people experience the game again but just keep the servers on then i don't know i think it's weird to like do the whole like shut down it's gone yeah hasta la vista or, or switch it over to like some peer-to-peer -peer thing or private server like knockout city did where like you can still play right, it if you really wanted to yeah if you can get the group together and they all have the game you can do like some private games that's at least better than nothing fun. medal of honor from 2010 surprisingly has a small community of people still playing like a very small community but a community nonetheless this game came out on the Xbox 360 generation, but it's on PC also. And people have been able to like emulate the servers using something called Neptune. And there's like a small Discord community of people who still jump on there and play that game. And that's cool. I know some people really liked that multiplayer experience, thought it was like different and fresh and cool for Medal of Honor. So th that one was a surprise to see for like fan related projects. It is very niche because Battlefield itself is already niche. And I felt always felt Medal of Honor is just the niche version of Battlefield. So like, right. it's like double niched and there's still people playing it. It's crazy. Yeah. And then there's some obvious ones out there that you can kind of like take or leave that I didn't know if should be included in this video in like an official capacity. Like Unreal Tournament, there's people still who have like servers up playing those games. And you could go back to a lot of the older games and find like those type of like private hosted servers that might not have official capacity support. But it's still interesting that they're like used in some way. That's how they handled it back in the day though. Because like... You can still go on all the old Counter-Strike games and people have their private servers on there and you can still just join the private servers and play it, you know what I mean? Can you still play Counter-Strike, like, Global Offensive now? Yes and no. You can, like, downpatch the game on Steam. But last right. time I checked, there wasn't meant much functionality. So that's the only one so, that's gone, I guess. But, like, the ones before that, you can still play. So, like, hypothetically, though, like, let's say you were really into, like, surfing in CSGO. Could you down patch and then, like, connect to people's servers? Like, if it was working, like, even if it's, like, broken right now? Last time, the servers didn't load, so 
don't right. think so. Like the intention is to allow people to do it though. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you can load up the surf maps by yourself if you really want to. Well, that's better than at least completely like these online games that completely just revoke access. But it's a little worse than what what they did in the the past because when CS 1.6 was out and Source came out, like both games just had their servers and you could just load uh, both play them whenever you wanted to. Right? Don't you think it's weird that they didn't just make Counter Strike Two, like? its own game instead of rebranding right what i think they should have done is like make counter strike to the csgo thing and then like upload csgo as its own game like where you can download it you know what i mean oh i get it really like, called like csgo legacy or something like because all the skins transfer that makes sense kind of like what call of duty does now with the call of duty hq except it's a little messier which <laughs> that know. is call an is weird, interesting thing we'll see in the future too where like overwatch one you know, it's gone. It was just right. patched with Overwatch 2, Counter-Strike 2, overpatched, like, uh, Counter-Strike Go. Do you think there's people out there who play older patches of, like, Overwatch 1? Because remember, we, a while back, we, like, were trying to figure out how to play older patches of Rainbow Six Siege, and we found, like, that small community on Discord, and they were playing, like, a 2016 season of Rainbow Six, like, and every weekend they changed out the season. Uh, like, do you think that exists for other games like Overwatch? Do you think they have the availability to figure out how to do that? I mean, I think it's possible. I guess it's just uh, demand and then someone that is able to do it, right? And I mean, for Siege, right. there was someone. I think that project has been DMC8, though, if I'm not mistaken. It seems like that actually happens from time to time. Just a lot of these little fan projects, they always risk getting, like, DMC8'd. Uh, you remember, like, Halo Online? That wasn't technically a resurrection of a game. It was more just a port of Halo 3 multiplayer with, like, a ton of new features, and then it got DMC8'd. I think, like, obviously from, like, a law perspective, a copyright perspective, they have all the rights to DMC8 them, right? But I think, like, there's no monetary loss from, like, people doing this. Does that make sense? Like, right. I don't think people playing, like, down patch versions of Siege aren't also playing Rainbow Six Siege. Or... If they're only playing the down pitch versions, they're not playing the regular Siege anyways. It's just custom games. I don't know. Like, the ranking thing should be, like, their big, like, pull on why you want to, like, stay up to date with new stuff. But now that I just thought of the Halo Online thing, that actually was a resurrection of a dead live service game. Because they had the live service game in Russia, right? Halo Online. And then that got shut down. And then fans reverse engineered it, translated it, and made, like... A Halo 3 experience for PC, which wasn't there at the time. Yeah, I loved that. I, the custom games on that were so much, like, they were just sweet. I wish, like, we could have access to some of the stuff that was in there in MCC nowadays, but that'll never happen. I don't think we're getting any <laughs> new Halo content besides, like, the seasons or whatever for Halo Infinite yeah. in, like, the next couple of years. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, Halo's a big oof right now. Battlefield 2142 actually had an interesting revival that happened a few years back. Fans were able to find a way to get the Battlefield 2142 servers online, and they did this whole thing called Battlefield 2142 Revival. Then they got DMCA'd. So uh, a different team came and revived it again and called it Battlefield 2142 Reclamation, and uh, they've been playing on there since. I do think it's funny, though, that... Uh, we were just talking about DMC8, and here we are. Battlefield, uh, just pulling out the good old EA card. Also, I, like I looked that. it up. There was like a, there's like so lobbies on that game. You can see like the stats and everything on the website, like and the names of the people playing. Um, oh, also talking about Battlefield, there's Battlefield Heroes, which also was shut down. But there is a Battlefield Heroes revival project called Rising Hub that doesn't seem to be too active, but it is at least playable again. Hey, that's cool. Battlefield Heroes is such an interesting concept of a game in general. Yeah, it is. It is, and I played it a lot actually because it was easy to access in the browser right it's just like a shooter oh, really? in the browser yeah Please. i think you had to download it that's I all mean, it was yeah i guess roblox is kind of in the browser too isn't it oh and also this one you know doesn't quite count yet but uh you know how the wii u and nintendo 3ds are gonna shut down the online services in april yeah i'm kind of uh, a little upset about that right and stuff like new leaf online would be lost for example right like yeah i, I thought they already shut that down actually but yeah no they're they're definitely sunsetting everything. Yeah, older. but there is hopes um, for a fan project that's, you know, been trying to, you know, preemptively already work on restoring online functionality called Pretendo. And, uh, you know, we'll see where that project goes. I'd be optimistic just because we've seen, like, these other projects that have existed. I mean, I think there's some old Nintendo DS projects that restored those services and Wii projects from a while back that still exist. So I wouldn't be too shocked to see this happen i mean people are figuring out for the xbox it just depends on if like the wii u and 3ds have like some weird restrictions like 
hard built into it. But with homebrew being pretty good on, at the very least, I know the 3DS. I think the Wii U probably does too. Uh, they'll probably be able to figure it out and have some sort of connectivity restored, which will be great for certain things, I guess. Pokemon, maybe? Being able to transfer your Pokemon is kind of important. The Pokemon Home thing, that will be like... Yeah. Completely that's good. a mess. Yeah, 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 it's a whole mess. I mean, people have been people are finally figuring out how to reverse engineer transferring Pokemon from Gen One to Gen Two. So, uh, technically, you could bring your Pokemon game if your battery hadn't run dry on your old Pokemon Red and Blue. You can get your Pokemon all the way from that game and transfer it all the way through Pokemon Home and stuff into like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Technically, there there is a way to do it. Um, I think like only one person has the, like the guy who made the device to like transfer from first gen to second gen, uh, or sorry, second gen to third gen is what I was trying to say. Cause that, first and second gen, you could transfer second to third gen. They didn't let you transfer. So you were stuck. But now with the guy, who, this, I, we'll put a link in the description to the guy who figured out the code to that because it's really interesting i it's was gonna not. go like way more in depth and i'm like you know what like just this... watch this guy's video honestly i think watch... i've watched it even I, I can't remember i can't re i watched it like a year ago i don't remember what his name is i don't remember what the video is i'm very unprepared to talk about the subject but we'll i mean it was it was good enough video uh, for you to still talk about it right now a year later yeah yeah so in this like random obscure podcast that no one's probably gonna listen this far to nonetheless um, this is a good wrapping up point, you think? Yeah, I think cool. we've uh, covered it all. All right. Well, thanks so much for watching. If you did manage to watch this far, that's insane. Thank you. Uh, huge shout out to our patrons for supporting our channel. If you want to have your name in the credits, like these people do, uh, you can throw a couple dollars our way on Patreon. Uh, we're heading into the season of YouTube where the AdSense is kind of going a little wild. So if you want to help, you know, keep things stable, it's always nice to have Patreon as like a little... A little extra, like, uh, production cash for us to work on these things. So, uh, yeah. But otherwise, thanks so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys all next time with a brand new video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.